Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin, and welcome to another edition of Digital Rebar Provision Meetup. This is edition number 15. Welcome to everybody. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some really fun and exciting stuff. Um, but first, let's get to who we got today. So today on the Rackin side, we've got Rob Hirschfeld, our uh, Learless Feeder and CEO and co-founder, and Greg Althaus as well as co-founder. And one of our founding software engineers, Victor Lauder, and myself. Uh, we're looking forward to providing some really exciting and cool demos. And uh, on community, we've got Lance Larson. I think Lance is your first time with us, so welcome very much. Uh, I hope you get some fun, fun info out of today. <laughs> and we have uh, Will Dennis back online with us, back from the, uh, uh, the dead, so to speak. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, Last week, we talked about, oh my goodness, workflows. Uh, workflows version two is a major step forward in how we handle uh, de developing, building, and uh, running uh, workflows. It moved the change stage map out of a profile uh, mechanism to uh, workflows, which is now a sort of a first class citizen of a, a field of its own uh, to define the progression of a machine stages through uh, the life cycle of its provisioning activities. Uh, so we talked a little bit about that. Uh, we've had a couple weeks to soak uh, with the new workflows features uh, sitting in the tip uh, version of digital rebar provision. And uh, we're about ready to cut version 3.80, uh, which will contain the workflows uh, and some other things we'll talk about a little later. Um, Oh, I have a look at that. <laughs> fix, fix, fix 14 to 13 to 14. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, so we're going to talk, we're going to continue that theme on the, the workflows version two and have Rob give us a little bit of a demo on using workflows. But we're going to do that in conjunction with the Terraform provider. Um, we've been hard at work at revisioning Terraform provider and adding some features and capabilities to it. And so it's going to be a twofer. We get to see a little bit of the newness in Terraform as well as driving machines through workflow, uh, workflows version two. Uh, we're going to follow that up with Greg. He's going to make up some song and dance for us. Uh, he's going to give us uh, a little bit of a demo on some uh, new capabilities in some of our plugins. I'm still not sure whether he's going to show us VirtualBox or Packet or heck, something else for that matter. So stay or tuned for that a little both. later in the show. <laughs> or maybe both. No, that's too much to ask for, too much to ask for. So we're going to talk a little bit about create and destroy of resources through plugin uh, against uh, cloudy like stuff, whether it's bare metal uh, operating in a cloud like fashion with Packet.net's. Uh, API interface uh, or a virtual box local on your machine or some of the other uh, plugin providers we have. Uh, so that gets us today's agenda and uh, I think we'll kick off. Rob, are you ready to demo? You want to lead the way with demo or you want a few more minutes? No, I'm ready. We're good. All right. So we're going to kick off with the Workflows V2 demo. Uh, and a little bit of the Terraform stuff. So we'll go ahead and pass over a screen share to Rob and let him take control of the helm. There we go. Oh, we got. Uh, yeah, I'm just doing my whole screen because that's um, easier. So uh, and I, I think I have a, a, a longer, I'm going to try and not get, take too long. It's not that hard to demo, really. Um, but if you want to go back and watch this, obviously this is recorded, but we have a recording just about this also. Um, I have a three node system that I, that I brought up. Um, in, uh, basically each one is now booted into um, Sledgehammer. So you can see it's booted into Sledgehammer. I've used the Terraform ready stage uh, and everything, oh, let me show you the docs too. So in the docs, um, we have an integration section and Terraform is down here. And so um, this explains a lot of these same processes and gives some examples. The, what, what we've done is there's a Terraform ready stage and that Terraform ready stage, it's, it's role in life um, 
sorry, its role in life is to uh, install the Terraform managed and allocated flags. So the Terraform plugin, um, I'll show that in just a minute, basically creates an inventory um, in from digital rebar using these the managed flags. So if a machine has this Terraform managed flag set to true, Terraform will treat it as an available machine, um, as a usable machine. If it's allocated false, then it's available in inventory. If it's allocated true, then that means somebody in Terraform is using it. Um, and it's, it's in the field, if you will, for Terraform. Um, uh, and then basically what, what I've done is the, the systems are in, in a ready state um, for this. So if I look at the workflows, I have the, the basic discover workflow in this case is super simple. It just goes to discover. Um, I'm using VirtualBox for the demo. And then, so I, I need to discover that. And then we just go to this Terraform ready stage to set the flags. I think there's a newer version that I have that sets, also sets the icon and you'll, you'll get some machine icon changes based on uh, moving through Terraform. And then um, I have two additional workflows that are set. I have an image deploy workflow that installs uh, the image uh, using, I'll, I'll I'm not assume everybody knows how that works. Um, so it does a, basically a deploy, it installs the runner, um, which is an important point to, you don't, you don't require the runner to make these workflows go, but it's handy. Um, and then it just, it marks complete. Complete is very important because the Terraform um, system is fundamentally asking for you to start a workflow in the 3.8 versions. It's gonna ask for you to start a workflow and then it's gonna wait until complete or complete no wait um, is the stage that the machines have been set to. So literally what's gonna happen in Terraform is we're gonna start a, a new workflow and then we're gonna just watch the machines until the stage, until we reach this stage. Um, and generally, uh, we, we try to color code the end, the final stages is uh, uh, green from that perspective. Um, and then I also have a CentOS install stage that does a CentOS install, installs the Sage keys, um, installs the runner, and then completes. And you can see they both require a reboot, but the reboots are at different points in that, that life cycle, um, how, how the systems operate. Uh, okay. So that's the basic, that's the basic environment that's been set up. Um, and that's about all that's required. You just have to have nodes that run the Terraform ready step. step. Uh, and so obviously Rob, behind this, we have some Terraform uh, configuration files. There we go. Yeah. And so in, so if you're not familiar with Terraform, uh, this is what a plan looks like for Terraform. It's a pretty straightforward, um, tool in general, and, and what we've done here is I've gotten two resources, um, one I've named Rob, one I've named Greg, and these are, these are DRP machine resources. Uh, and I could create a bigger cluster, one or two. In this case, I'm just going to create a two machine cluster. Uh, I'm going to set the icons. So if this is useful. Um, basically, any machine, I'll show what that looks like. So if I looked at a, a machine here, and I look at the JSON data, that the machine returns, instead of doing it from the command line. Did I miss it? I missed it. Um, every one of the, the fields in the machine is available in Terraform. So what I, what I can do is I can set, except for the read-only ones like UUID, um, but I can set uh, any of these items in that plan. So as I look at the plan here, what is go, what's going on is I can, I'm, I'm creating, I'm basically pulling a machine out and then I'm setting meta, meta field. So I can set its, its icon. I'm setting its workflow. This is the one required field to make this, this work uh, in 3.8. In 3.7, you did the same thing, but you used a stage. Um, and then uh, that would then require a reboot or some other action to kick it off. In workflow, uh, you don't need that workflows will go through reboot cycles completely on their own. It's, it's, a, it's a much more powerful way to do it. But I'm saying the image, that workflow to image deploy, which is gonna move me from a um, discover state into, into workflow. I'm gonna set a description on that node. 
and then I'm going to build a second machine. And the only difference between these two machines right now is that one is going to use the, the red rocket capability. Um, there is a, whoops, there is, um, so in this directory, I've basically got the latest Terraform provider. Um, there's a link to that from the documentation. Um, one thing I would warn people about is if you do look at the GitHub here, I make this mistake all the time, so I'm pointing it out to people. You look at the releases, uh, you can be confused about the date for what tip is. Um, we created the, the release tip on, in August. The files are actually more recently updated. You just don't see the timestamps. So just as a heads up, if, if you look at look at tip and you're like, ah, it's out of date, it's not. It, it, the, the date here, the date stamp is not ideal. So don't make, if you're trying this at home, just be warned that tip, you want to use tip right now until we, we go through the release process um, because that's what exposes workflows. Um, so I get the DRP provider. I have my Terraform provider. Um, in this case, I don't, I don't need or I don't want the state files, so let me remove those um, just in case there's some cruft. I don't think there is. And so at this point, if I want to do that work, make it a little bigger for everybody. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up bulk machines in the background. Since the UX has live updates, we can actually watch the allocation happen uh, as I type. So I'm going to try and give you both, both views into the system. If I say Terraform init, I have to initialize the plugin. Yay, that's all good. And then I can uh, verify the plan. So if I say plan, it's going to look at that uh, plan I just showed you show and tell you what what items are being set so I can do some pre validation. And then when I'm ready, I can just say apply. And you can see in the background, it's actively going through and building um, the two images. So two of these machines, two and three switched. Uh, the reason I set the icons is it's super handy to get the immediate feedback. You know, this is the red rocket and this is the, the name node. Um, it is possible to set the name even with um, Terraform provider it won't change the VM names. So I like to keep my virtual box names um, lined up for that. But it's literally going through and, and providing the, um, the status. Uh, and when it's done, so right here, you'll see it's going through. Normal Terraform behavior is waiting for the system to come back and say, I'm done. And at that point, it will um, release Terraform saying, I've completed the system. Uh, if there isn't enough resources, if there are enough servers, something like that, you'll, it'll fail and you'll have to do normal Terraform cleanup. Um, so I'm waiting. This, this, is, this will be done in just a second. It usually takes a um, minute to two minutes, depending on the workload on my machine. There you go, one minute. Uh, the top node three just finished, so node two is just behind it. Not bad, one minute, 13 seconds to deploy two CentOS machines. Um, so in this case, um, it's done, the system is, is finished. And if I now turn around and say destroy, validate that the machines are going down, it now has destroyed the machines. Uh, it returns very quickly because it's just going, it's just setting them back to discover. And as soon as DRP says it's started that process, Terraform can be re released. Um, what you would want to do in a real uh, Terraform as a service case, you would add in a cleanup step, um, some recovery, right, things like that. But I want to show you, so that's the basics. Um, what I do want to do is jump over and extend this a little bit in some interesting ways. Um, one thing I could do is if I wanted, instead of uh, image deploy, I could just say CentOS. And that would switch the workflow to use the CentOS workflow. So now it's, instead of using the image deploy, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a coffee break before my install is done and install CentOS the old school way. Um, and so that's one thing. And then the other thing we've been doing is there's some some built-in fields. So the lowercase fields are the built-in fields here. Um, and what I could do is I can take advantage of um, what those exit other, and I'm going to look at the docs for that. So those special fields allow you to, um, where are they? Um, 
oh, here they are. You can actually say what your decommissioning workflow is. So it is possible to override some of the default behaviors that we have in the system. So if I wanted, instead of decommissioning to a decommission workflow, um, I could go, I could take my uh, discover workflow here. Uh, I could clone that uh, and I could call it cleanup. graduate hat or something. Um, and then, so the cleanup workflow, what you could actually do is come in and add in um, some type of decommissioning step, burn in. Um, I could set my, I could set different icons if I wanted uh, it to do that. Oops, gotta actually drag and drop, right? Um, I don't have my burn in step stage solved, but if I had a, st a step that said uh, wipe disks, um, which I know there's a stage in here somewhere for, then I'd be able to take advantage of, of that as a, as a workflow process. And then to use it, what I would be able to do is come in and say decommission workflow equals uh, cleanup like that. And so that would override this default behavior to go back to discover. Discover is hard coded in. Um, and there's also overrides if I don't want to watch, if my, if my workflows don't end in complete, I can override that. If I want to have a decommission icon, I can actually set a decommission icon. Um, and the reason why I like things like this is that this would allow me um, some additional like a hashtag. It, this would allow some additional controls or visibility. So if I'm an operator watching people use the system, uh, it's coded right now to set the icons back to this map. Um, but I could override that behavior so it's easier for me to track when machines come and go in the behaviors without having to do as much reading of text. I can quickly scan a list and see, oh, look, it's, it's in this different view. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna change the workflow out of image deploy um, because I wanna, I wanna run through this very, very quickly and show you what that would look like. Um, so in this case, I can go back in, um, I can actually run my plan again. Uh, it'll go through and do, do that install. And then at the end, uh, I didn't change the, the front bound uh, deployment, but now when I tear it down, it's gonna set, it's most it sets the icons uh, forward again. So that gives me really quick visual clues. Ah, the other thing to note while we wait for that is, um, there's additional components in the documentation where you can do things like set profiles um, additively. One warning I would have is if you go in to, to here and say, oh, I want to set my profiles equal to my array of whatever my profiles are, it's going to overwrite the profiles that you've got. So there is an add profiles uh, special marker in the system. Same with parameters. You want to be able to add parameters like that. Um, just be careful as you set an object that you're, you're overwriting whatever's there. And so for some things that could be a problem, it could be good. There's also filters. And so one of the, the really interesting features to me is, is that you could actually build a Terraform plan that included filters to say, I want a machine with a certain number of drives or a certain amount of RAM. Anything that the UX provides, or not the UX, the API provides as a filter you can then use as a reason to, fill, to, to screen machines in or out of your selection criteria. So um, we've really exposed all of the API capabilities that BRP has um, from that perspective. And it's, it's, if, if people aren't aware of it, the behind the scenes, the API actually provides an, a list of indexes. You can query and ask the API which indexes it supports. Um, you can actually see some of these things if you look at the filter on a lot of the UX views, the filter is based on what these, um, these API uh, indexes are. And so you can come in and make all sorts of, of decisions about how you wanna to run the environment um, when you're done. So let me destroy things over here. And you'll notice in the background, uh, and so type yes, these, these machines are also going to actually be rebooted. And then the one, the change I made here is now it's going into the cleanup workflow and it set the hashtag. So if you're in a, you know, this is the place where I would want to be using Terraform. If I'm doing a whole bunch of work, building different environments and testing it, then, or like in a CI, uh, CI CD pipeline, 
I would actually be able to identify which processes and which machines are being allocated to which processes, when they've been finished, how, they, how things are getting cleaned up. And so it allows you in a system where you're not really touching uh, digital rebar directly to still provide feedback to the users about how digital rebar works. And it's, that was it. I, I did two full deployment cycles out of here. Um, and then I guess I exercised most of the Terraform features too. Greg, is there anything that you're nodding, so. No, that's good. That's, that's awesome. This is Greg's work. I'm just, I'm, I'm just the voice. But Greg, Greg was the primary author on the Terraform provider stuff. I got to clean it. I got to add the workflow features. Yeah, good. Um, and the documentation. And the docs. I don't believe in docs. <laughs> that's not true. Your name is in them. Um, so that's how we get Greg to read the docs. We, we sprinkle his name throughout. I wrote a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I'm just teasing. Um, all right. Any other questions before I turn? <laughs> now I'm going to be the so subject. Is one of the things I, I noticed a little earlier on when you were showing um, the profile. Yeah. Uh, you had a change stage map in that profile, but you're using workflows V2. Correct. So, so one of the things that uh, people should note is uh, if a workflow is set on a machine, the workflow supersedes the old uh, change stage map methodology. If no workflow is set, then the machine uh, will fall back to a change stage map as set by a profile and pram on the machine. So it's just important to note um, not to be confused because you saw the might have seen the change stage map earlier in uh, Rob's presentation. We're not using change stage map for workflow management. So there you go. Uh, yeah, so that that is not actually in operation in this case because a workflow was set on the machine. Yeah, I, I'm, that might have, I'm not sure where that came in from. Um, I need to figure that out because this is a brand new machine I just added using the feature Greg's about the demo. Um, so I need to figure out where the, why it's set. Probably did it. Uh, so there be a, a mystery to be solved at another time. Yep. Yeah. So in the meantime, Rob, thank you very much. That's awesome. It's really cool to see um, being able to create, um, move a machine through workflows and exercise some of the Terraform parts. Uh, and how all that interacts. It's a very cool operator pattern uh, and also potential op, uh, pattern for people to use for uh, sort of a multi-tenant use to be able to hand over pools of machines through Terraform usage for various groups to be able to call for bare metal and be able to consume bare metal just like a, a cloud sort of resource with create and destroy pattern. Very, very cool. Um, moving on, uh, Greg is going to show us something interesting. So, Greg, it's your show, my friend. Dang, man. It's a little more <laughs> focused than that. Not much, but a little. Um, so, one of the things we've been working on with the plugins, specifically the packet and virtual box, as started by Victor on some of the KVM uh, plugin work that he was doing, we added the ability to Kind of inspect the virtual systems and to get inventory about what's out there and also create virtual machines from within uh, DRP's API calls. So the idea is that um, we've added some new actions. So as part of the plugin we work we did a while back, plugins can now provide actions. Hey, so, Greg, can you make your text yeah, a little bigger, please? I figured you were going to whine about that, so that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so in this case, these are my, so this is on my VirtualBox local plugin. I have some new actions that the provider has. There's a stop VM, a start VM, a destroy VM, and a create VM. Notice there's some new parameters, so I can issue a set of commands to say DRP plugins um, run action 
vi local create vm and then i can say virtual box uh, name equals fred uh, maybe it's fred so now what this is going to do is create a virtual box instance named fred on my local system and you can see it being created started it creates the machine in this case this path just basically dumps it into the default system values. Um, I could have added additional things like CPU, memory size, stuff like that. Um, and then it's in the process. It'll go through and start it. Um, we generate logs for these now so that you can actually see them in the log system. So in this case, I can see it's starting to finish querying. It's created it. It's finishing the query of it to get proper inventory to set things like uh, the MAC addresses so that IPs can be associated, and then it'll actually start the system. My MacBook's been running a little slow with everything on it, but that should start up here in a second. This also, so this works from the plugin side where I can say create me something plugin. And so here it is starting, it finally, my MacBook finally caught up, and here it is booting the system. This will actually drive into the discovery process and away we go. Um, the system takes a set of parameters. So like on the create, I can send it the number of CPUs and it has defaults for those. So if you don't specify them, it works. Um, but you can also do this, not just from the plugin side, but you can also do it from the direct machine create side. So then I can say like, let me create a VM Linux system and I want it to go into the discover workflow. This time it'll do a little more stuff. I don't want to set any of those, but I need to set a magic parameter when I go through this because I need to tell the, the plugins which plugin should pay attention to this machine create. So this is an example of us using our plugin system to pay attention to events. And when it sees a machine create event, it looks for a parameter and says, should I do something? And if it finds it, it then takes action based upon those machine creates and deletes. So in this case, it's going to find it, it's going to create it. So for this path, I'm going to say, give me two CPUs, uh, give me, um, let's see, virtual box disk size. Um, let's have 60 gig of disk, disk space. And then I want to add uh, mem size or gig, I might want to deploy Windows later, so I need a lot of a lot of stuff. And then because Rob's watching, I'll make it a green spy icon, just save. And so then I can say go. Um, still working on the little why the window doesn't close on the ad, but you can see in the background, if I refresh, there's my VM Linux with the spy. And if I bring up my system it's in the process of coming up and getting started in this case you can see fred was started with the default of two gig and two processors but linux was built with a 90 or 4k 4 gig and two processors and away we go now the plugin providers have also on oh, here it is starting and running but notice this time the workflow was set because i set the workflow this allows us to drive and create machines with starting parameters profiles and other options so you can actually build a full machine create API call with all the parameters, all the workflows, all the things that you want it to do and have it go. And then as, as if you look at the machine, you can see it has its plugin that's managing it and then the various components. Now, um, the packet uh, provider has also been uh, updated with these features as well. So it all lets you create um, or reserve instances out of the packet pools and to the right project groups and all these other things. Both providers have been set to automatically, though I think I'm gonna add a parameter to let you turn this ability off, um, import existing infrastructure that you have that it detects based upon the keys you give it. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add my packet IPMI provider. It's going to make me enter a key and um, I could specify 
the default project I want in packet, but in this case, I'm going to use a key that I'm going to delete after this so that you guys can't just like totally crash my systems. Um, so I'll add that. And so now as the plugin starts, it will go out and start inventorying and bringing in my packet machines out in the various plugins and or projects that I have. So then, then I can manage them from there. Um, and assuming everything works correctly, I should see lots of them. Um, oh, I have some debug messages too. So there we go. I will need to clean that up too. But we can see you also can get the logs on these kind of things as well. Um, assuming everything kind of is happy, or it's just, my machine is just really slow. So, um, but if I go, oops, don't go there. Yeah, it's, it's sweet. So at this point, um, the cake is still alive. So you can see I'm slowly picking them up out from packet. If I go log in, um, all of the things we expect and love from our packet provider, it imported the fact that it's on Newark, so bare metal zero, it's in this project. I can get the uh, remote console. All of those things are populated, but I can then, in this case, I'll slowly gather them. The other thing that we've also enabled is if you delete from this path, the systems will be cleaned up. So in this case, I'm deleting my virtual box instance. You can see over here, it just turned it off and deleted the resources. So you get full control of the virtual environment from DRP. So, um, but as they say in Spider-Man, great powers come with great responsibilities. Um, you have to worry about if you accidentally delete these, they will be deleted on the virtual box side. So um, I'm looking for community feedback about that feature as well, because um, it's useful, it's very powerful, but man, can you shoot your toes off. So just be aware. It'd be hard to turn off. The so feature. anyway, there we go. That's kind of the new plugin features. Those are in tip and will be cut here shortly into 3.8 or whatever the plugin version is that corresponds to 3.8. Excellent. <clears throat> Anything else about Greg? Um, I, I have one item to, one thing to point out that um, is worth noting because um, this sort of slipped in as a feature. So when Greg created a new, a new machine, uh, machine entry showed up and then a little bit later the address showed up mm. and um, this isn't related to the plugin it's it's related to the way plugin creates machines so the plugin creates a machine stub it's then being booted as a virtual box machine once the lease is secured for the mac address the system actually associates the machine and the mac address together and populates the address on the machine before it's booted so as soon as we know that there's a, there's a MAC address and an IP, um, we update the machine for you. And you can actually watch the behavior. I didn't want to interrupt, uh, no, Greg, that's right. but you can watch the behavior of, of the addresses coming in from the lease um, during this process. And so there's a, it's one of those, uh, I think a 3.7 feature that showed up. It's yep. super awesome. And the, the packet side does that as well. You'll actually see like if you create a machine through the, machine, the DRP machine create path, you'll see the machine get created. It'll then kind of say, okay, it's spinning. And then all of a sudden the address will show up once it's been allocated on the packet side and comes back around. Right. And, but that's a good note that um, this only works if we a control the DHCP service. So if you're using your own external DHCP service, you don't get that feature. But if we have API access to uh, in the case of packet to their, allocations then we can through the api pull that and populate that field that's correct those yeah. sledgehammer will update it yes sledgehammer will also update yeah. the address field if it uh you know gets an ip address which hopefully it was hopefully it will otherwise it you know, can't talk to in the first place right so there is a little bit of a safety valve in sledgehammer that will attempt to set the address if it's not set on a machine as it boots the first time so if things are discovered and things like that. So it'll previously Sledgehammer was entirely responsible for that, but then I went ahead and added the ability for the DHCP system to figure out, uh, oh, hey, this MAC address belongs to this system, and we know about this system, so here's its new address. 
Okay. There you go. Excellent. I uh, love it. I love uh, where we're going with all of this. It's uh, really turning into quite a powerful platform. Um, any questions from our muted uh, community out there uh, on chat? Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and kick in uh, with them. And if I see them, we'll pick them up. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's talk a little bit about version 3.8. We're we've got 3.8 coming around the corner. Uh, it's been another relatively long uh, release cycle for us, but we've crammed a lot of really good features in it. Uh, some of which we've seen just now with the new workflows. We've seen a lot of the plugins starting to mature and grow some features that isn't necessarily related to uh, 3.8.0, but a lot of the the work in 3.8.0 enables us to be able to build in those advanced capabilities and features. Um, Greg and uh, Victor and Rob, you guys want to talk a little bit about some of the features we've got coming in uh, with 3.8.0 and Greg, um, I think you said earlier today, we're looking at in the next day or three-ish, we'll be cutting 3.8.0 as uh, a release. Yeah, that's the, the plan. The big feature change coming in 3.8 is workflows. We've kind of been talking about it and showing it. Um, we're finalizing that. We think we've gotten the, the works and stuff taken care of. Um, we've used it in a few places and it, it's looking good. Um, and I think we've gotten a lot of the design issues worked out to make ourselves happy with it. It, it looks like a good set of features and, and extensions to the stage system. Um, and I, in previous sessions, we've talked about what that feature set is and why we did it and stuff. So I won't go through that again. Um, a right. few other things that are coming in three. UX now. Yeah, oh, you, UX now has workflows. Um, you have to have a workflow enabled DRP to get those panels in the UX. So if you're like using your UX and you don't notice them and you're like, where are they? Realize it's probably because you're not running tip DRP. Um, so we've, taken advantage of the um, feature flags to, to be able to hide and control those kind of functions. So what is your stance on the release of Workflows V2 uh, in 3.8.0? Are we going to mark that production ready? Or are we going to mark that feature um, tech preview? Um, what, what is our nomenclature, how we're going to mark that when we release 3.8.0? I'm saying it's a full feature at this point, I think. Okay, all right. I don't, we ain't holding anything back. We're, we're also not deprecating the old version, so that's right. keep working. So there's no, there's no forced migration. Yeah, in fact, what you'll see in the UX, if you go through that path, if you're used to configuring your change stage maps, notice that there's a toggle here, and you get your old view to be able to manage and manipulate change stage maps. That's still there, that functionality still works. Victor did a good job of maintaining both functionality sets and they're overridable. So if you set a workflow on a machine, it will use that. If you unset a workflow on a machine, it'll fall back to the stage, change stage. So you can use, oh, sorry. I showed my screen, which I'm not sharing anymore. So, uh, <laughs> thank you for saying. Um, but the point is you can drive those systems both ways now. In fact, they can exist in parallel and be used on different machines, even the same machine at different times in bizarre and weird ways. Please don't, she's one. <laughs> uh, it'll work, but it'll get confusing. Right, so that's just, that's where that is. Um, the, like I said, there's a few other, there's some other things like with the plugins being updated um, and enhanced. There's some changes for a uh, sledgehammer. So expect a sledgehammer update in the 3.8 content change. Um, we're enhancing some of the support in sledgehammer to be able to generate all the various types of boot environments that we think we care about. I'm sure there'll be others one day, but the big thing that's coming there is support for EFI based file systems so that we can, you know, BFAT so that we can actually drive the full construction of EFI images, um, boot images for the in image install path. Um, the image install plugins, which while racking content are getting filled out, flushed out, 
and um, that are supported through this process. Um, as Rob was showing, it's really, really fast. So um, it's kind of an interesting alternative to your kickstarts. Um, and there's some future discussions in there that we can maybe talk about one day, but um, let's see what else. Those are the main ones. There's, there's been some content cleanups, um, set up that tipple map, uh, refactored and shoved into more places. Um, we use infinite tokens in more places mm -hmm. so you can have your systems chill out and slash hammer for more than an hour without timing out. Yeah. Lots of little, yeah. Yeah. Lots of little cleanup it. bits like that in content that in the CLI. It's worth noting that this change, um, the stages have always required the runner. And so some of what we're doing is we're, we're, we're turning on the assumption that people are going to keep using the runner um, more so than they have been before. So. And, and with that, one of the things we're acknowledging is that um, with workflows, the idea of having a long running task for burn in or validation or even installs that take a long time, sometimes those tokens were too short, remembering to change them. And so since we already give you a way to invalidate tokens by changing machine secrets or system level secrets um, to invalidate tokens, um, we decided to convert the um, base tool set to use the uh, infinite tokens so that um, you can leave machines idle and still recover them. Um, yeah. Oh, one thing to note, those infinite tokens are locked down to that specific machine. So you yeah, can't just grab right. it and use it somewhere else. That's right. It to work. That's right. And they're they are, tightly scoped. Yeah, they're very tightly scoped tokens. Um, let me think. What else? We, we split. If you if you're using Kube Spray, um, sorry, not Kube Spray. Um, actually, Kube Spray too. So we we did we did start the process of splitting our Ansible integrations from Kube Spray so that they were more standalone, and then um, the crib stuff actually is getting more refined too, and it's being split into more discrete stages. Because what we're trying to do is is integrate the uh, machine workflow, the sorry, machine image capabilities and cubes and crib together, so that you could boot a machine that already had um, ninety percent of the crib work done. And so we're we're tweaking the, um, the stages uh, to accommodate that better. Yeah, and along the crib lines, as soon as I uh, get a proper stage one. Um, built then we'll have for those on the commercial side we'll have a, a crib image ready to go to deploy for uh, live in mem boot uh, kubernetes clusters or installed kubernetes clusters through the traditional uh, image deploy reboot cycle yep I, I had a question for you about default workflows hmm. yeah oh just a second and shane on that victor and i need to talk <laughs> we have a plan yes all right it's very I awesome. Like plan. Are they evil uh, plans? It's actually based on your stuff, so it's a it's a good thing. Okay, I like it. All, this, all the work you started, we're going to actually drastically start abusing. <laughs> oh dear. Um, default work. So I had a question about default workflows because uh -huh. I've been working in TIFF, which didn't have a default workflow. Um, when? What do you mean a default workflow? Sorry, it didn't like global. Have, uh, no, it didn't have. So when, like, when I start the system, it has a, a cut like a global profile. It has there's some content that comes in through the community content by default. You need a default workflow if you're, you don't need a default, but you, you should. You know, building a default. The wizard's been updated to ask if you have a workflow or not. But um, people are going to need sort of that that initial workflow. Is one come in for them, or do they no. always have to build it? Then this is a, we're drawing a line in the sand right now that I'm sure we'll cross one day. Um, but the initial point is workflows are something that customers use to define what they want machines to do. So we don't necessarily have a default workflow. The default stage is still discovered because we need that to do proper discovery. So if you don't have a workflow, it'll, the machine will start in discovery. We decided we didn't want to have a default workflow because it would be basically the default workflow is discover, which is just the default stage. Right. So it seemed like 
um, overkill to push all that stuff out to say, you're going to have a default workflow. It's going to be read only just clutters up the space. So we're starting from that as a position because we believe that workflows in general aren't necessarily content. They're, they're operational aspects of how you choose to run your environment. So this is where you actually need to put your, what you want your machines to do to drive process. Um, now we'll still provide a whole bunch of stages and stuff that you can make compose, but the idea is that we didn't want to bias that path. So that's kind of the, the starting point. Now, let's say, Greg, what the heck are you talking about? Can you show me an example one? Sure, we should probably have some examples. Um, I think the docs I have some. They do, I can put the wizard back in just for somebody to build Yeah, and so the that's our you know philosophical position on that right now today. A read-only workflow is sort of frustrating. So yeah. yeah, it's really supposed to be, you know, the, this is the end user content that we expect people to build out of the stages that we provide and a combination of stages we provide and a combination of stages that the customer provides and just drag and drop them that's built in however you want. Makes a lot of sense to me. I it's uh, it's something that people should expect when they do a 3.8 install, they're going to need to build a workflow. Oh, they, we, we, they, they already did a demo on uh, building a workflow with the new thing and showing how. Uh, Rob actually showed we, we did. Oh, oh, okay. did. Yeah. Right. And, and to be fair, 3.7 and before didn't have a default workflow either. You had well, to have a workflow period. <laughs> no, right. they, well, you, you had to build it. Right? Change stage, but default change stage. So that's that's right. And, and, right. and so that's kind of the, the thought process, okay. right? Um, Especially since, um, I, yeah, my usage so far of the workflows as well as the change stage maps is I'm usually composing them for the environment that I'm working in at that moment. So if it's packet, I'm taking discover and packet discover and, you know, sledgehammer weight. Or if I'm doing Terraform, I replace sledgehammer weight with Terraform ready, right? Those kind of workflows are fairly simple to create now. I mean, they were simple before, but they're simple to create and they're unique to what I'm doing at that moment. Um, now, with all that said, you can build content packs with workflows in them and import those and, work and that fine. all works fine. So it, that's what I'm saying. We've kind of drawn this line in the sand, but it's really easy to step over. <laughs> um, and so right now we're doing that, right? I mean, I could see entirely having the packet IPMI provider provide a packet discover workflow, right? That takes discover and puts packet discover with it. And, right, but the wizard lets you do that in like 30 seconds. And we'll just, I just need to forward port the wizard. So, okay. I, so that, I, really the question is, should I forward port the wizard? And the answer is yes, um, because we're not gonna create a default workflow. It makes sense to me. I guess that was my question. Okay. Long-winded answer. There you go. Done. All so right. about about the content packs. Um, so you're saying, Greg, that you won't ship anything in the base framework as far as a like a default content pack, but people, you no, guys no, 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 are. Will Will misunderstood. The default content pack still exists. All I said was there will not be a default workflow object in that content pack. Oh, okay, right, right. I think that, yeah, I misspoke. So, so, I get, right, so the default content pack will not have a workflow, but you guys or maybe us guys could publish content packs to maybe a central place that people could consume for like example workflows yes. with the necessary templates and brands. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Will, that we've been kicking around internally was uh, working on some sort of centralized um, store or library for uh, community content to exist and we would have some sort of vetting process to say, you know, thumbs up, not, you know, not that it's good or bad, but you've been validated and tested. What's on work or there can be some sort of community mechanism around that. Okay, cool. Those, those are some things that we've been kicking around. We haven't had a chance to flesh out.
but as you can see on the, the screen, uh, share here, workflows is just like any other content. And yep. so it can be rolled up into content packs equally. Right. And I, I'm, I'm thinking something like Ansible Galaxy. I mm -hmm. mean, as a exactly. long range thing. Yeah. Chef cookbook. Or yeah, exactly. Like, right. A clearinghouse for this stuff. All, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, to help the community members not reproduce the same steps and also to draw inspiration from. It's a great learning tool when you're first learning to look at how someone else has um, pieced together something and that gives you inspiration and, and learning knowledge to jumpstart your ability to generate and, and build new you know, useful workflows and content. And, and what one of my goals is I want to avoid the proliferation of nearly the same but not interchangeable uh, things. Yes, exactly. So, and in fact, I do that an awful lot myself. I'm often renaming workflows or not workflows, but stages to, to match workflows because I don't like the generic names. Um, to, to go a little more old school, I can't count the number of times that I've cloned someone else's chef uh, cookbooks just to modify them to actually work in my use case. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm, I'm imagining there's always going to be some level of that customization that works for someone but not for you. And, and so there'll still be that to some degree, but... Yeah. Well, the, the flip side of the way we built this is that you get read-only behavior. So if you pull in somebody else's thing and modify it, if they patch something, you can still pull in their particular change, which is not something we saw in the um, And so, right, that's something we tried to avoid. The, uh, the flip side is also true. If I'm a, if I'm a, a corporate user or an operator and I want to control my, my workflows, Actually, this is a question around this. If I create, if I import a workflow or any object in a layer, and then I create a similarly versioned a new a new copy with the same name, it's can't it'll fail. You can't. You can't. Only content types. Yeah. We are very the, the the content layer has the ability to define how it should handle those issues. Currently, we are very conservative on how we set those flags, mm -hmm. so very rarely can layers override it. On default, that can't happen, um, and we will probably keep it that way until there's a compelling use case to switch. So, so this is a feature from the, the perspective I'm an operator. I write workflows for all my machines. Nobody's going to come in and tweak that workflow to add a stage or change a stage of, that I'm depending on. In, in, it's it's going to be that. Um, so there's no. It would be, be very difficult to hack in a. Oh, look! I'm adding a send all data to. Rob's, you know, S3 bucket uh, right. stage into a workflow if you, if you imported it as a content. That content not coming out short, by the way. It, it damn straight. <laughs> uh, all right, gentlemen, so we need to be wrapping up here, reaching the top of the hour. Uh, any last questions from community or any last thoughts, uh, Greg, Victor, Rob? I got Excellent. We're done. All right. Well, uh, Rob and Greg, thank you very much for the demos. Uh, it was fantastic to see uh, the new workflows in operation with Terraform and seeing some of the really interesting behavior you can drive uh, with Terraform and also uh, the new create destroy patterns and uh, import and management of existing infrastructure patterns that uh, Greg showed us both in VirtualBox and Packet.net. Uh, next meetup will be on the 24th of April. So we're going to skip over dreaded tax day, no meetup on tax day in case some of you are madly scrambling to finish your taxes last minute. Uh, so we'll see you all again on April 24th and we'll publish the meetup agenda in the usual channels soon. And the uh, replay video for today's meetup will be available in a couple hours. We'll drop the link in the uh, community Slack channel. And we'll also um, publish that on the Meetup site. Uh, speaking of the community Slack channel and community, uh, for those of you who are listening, if you have a GitHub accounts, we would really appreciate if, if you would go to uh, the digital rebar slash provision uh, project in GitHub and give us some stars. 
Uh, we're really looking to try and elevate uh, visibility of the digital rebar provision uh, project within the GitHub community, and STARS is one of those methods that we are able to elevate it. So if you haven't yet done so, please do. Go give us a star. Until then, we'll see you on April 24th. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Shane. All right. Thanks, Shane. Please stop that. Stop the recording. Sorry. <laughs>